Biden. Hello, so I'm JJ Joaquin, and welcome to this edition of Philosophy and What Matters, where we discuss things that matter from a philosophical point of view. Now, our topic for today is the philosophy of time. The great English philosopher Freddie Mercury once said, time waits for nobody. Well, he's not really a philosopher, and you all know that, but many of us would still share his sentiment. Time seems to flow at a steady pace from the past into the future, and it is indifferent to whatever our hopes and dreams might be. But what's the underlying philosophical idea behind this sentiment? And it, is it the right view to take on the matter? In the first place, why does it even matter to think about the nature of time? Now, to guide us through the philosophy of time, we're joined by our good friend, Graham A. Forbes, head of the Department of Philosophy at the University of Kent. And we'll start. Hello, Graham. Welcome to our philosophy and what matters. So let's start Hello. with the question right away. What is time? And to be precise, how do philosophers tackle the question about the nature of time? Well, kind of typically for philosophers, we break it down into lots of smaller questions that we might make a bit more progress on. So I find it really useful to think in terms of contrasts. So how is time different to space? Um, and how is the past different to the future? Um, and then there's questions about, is time something that mainly humans uh, are responsible for, or is it something that we're detecting in the world um, in some way? Um, is, is this something that's the same for everybody? So is it the case that some languages um, have a role for time that other languages don't? So these sorts of questions are the kind of questions that we try and deal with, and, and hopefully by being a bit more specific, we can make some progress on them. Okay, so just to make some distinctions here. So your, your first point is that when philosophers tackle the, the philosophy of time, they're also tackling a question about space. Is time like space? So wouldn't yeah. that be a kind of nature question? What is the nature of time? Is it like space? Does it flow? Does it have a unique direction? Is that what's the thing going on here? Yeah, so the difference, so the thought with flow is that flowing seems to be a thing that time does mm -hmm. in a way that space doesn't. Space doesn't flow. Um, so if you think that there's any flow at all, there's got to be some respect in which time is different to space, where if you think that um, change over time is just like variation over space, um, you think that they're not different in that respect, um, that they're just sort of dimensions in a four-dimensional manifold. Um, so to get a grip on the question of the nature of time, we need to think about how it compares to, to something with a somewhat similar nature. Okay. You also mentioned about uh, language we use to talk about this yeah. thing. So you distinguish between whether we experience those things and produce some language, describe them. Uh, is this a kind of semantic question as well? Yes. Um, so, so historically, particularly in about the 1960s, people were very interested in this question of whether you can eliminate tense from language. So whether you could have a language that um, described everything, including the idea of being sort of now and, and having stuff in the past and stuff in the future, um, whether you could capture all this without referring to a, a privileged now. Um, and there was a certain level of, of work going, look, we found this language in Northeastern Canada or um, in Kenya. And in these languages, they don't have any time or they don't. Um, the debate has largely moved on since then, not to a question of what individual languages do, um, but to a question of how we make sense of, um, how we make sense of time sort of given any linguistic resources that we want to use. So we might use a formal language, like a formal semantics, to sort of model what's going on. Um, and so do we have a formal semantics that has a special role for now, or do we have uh, a semantics that says that now is just 
um, an indexical. It's just like here, again, the analogy with space, like here, just pointing at the, the time we're at um, rather than the place we're at. Um, but there's no sense of a changing now. So, so when you're using your language to describe your theory, um, it's important to work out what that language is committing you to. Okay, so this are kind of privileging about the now. So is there a kind of ontological specialness about the present or the now in this discussion? I mean, so there could well be. Um, so one way of viewing what we're doing when we do ontology is we're just working out what the commitments of our best theory are. So if we've got this language that we think is the language that best captures the world and that language privileges the now or says that there's a difference between the past and the future in that we've got some kind of commitment to the past and not to the future or something like that, that's just going to create ontological commitments because uh, according to a post-Quinean view of what ontology is, your, your commitments to what exists are just whatever your best theory is committed to. So, um, so the question of ontology here is playing a, quite a special role in, um, in committing you to something that's a consequence of your theory. A lot of the questions about the nature of time might be compatible with lots of different ways of cashing out what exists um, because they're compatible with different ways of turning that into a rigorous formal semantics. Okay, so why does it matter to ask the question about the nature of time? Why does it matter to ordinary people, like ordinary laymen, laypersons? Um, <laughs> so I think, I think that's an excellent question. I think that's one of the most important questions because if we lose sight of that, the, the formal semantics and the ontology doesn't seem to do anything for us. Um, the joke answer to that question I always have is, well, ask me again in five minutes. Um, <laughs> okay. We're, we're stuck in time. Um, so we're stuck in time in kind of two ways. So sometimes I find my, myself desperately wanting something to be over. You know, I'd quite like the global pandemic to be over and, and to get on. I don't, I don't get a choice about that particularly. I've got to wait it out. You know, um, I can go and visit a different place. Apart from quarantine restrictions, I can go and diff visit a different place, but I'm kind of stuck in, in the place in time I'm at. But not only am I stuck in time, I'm not stuck at the same time. If I want something not to change, if I think, well, I've got a deadline coming up, I really, I'd, I'd like, you know, I'd like to stay here before I've missed the deadline. No, no, I'm going to get dragged, despite my preferences, into a future where I've missed the deadline unless I, unless I work very hard. So there's this sort of double stuckness that we have. Um, and not only is there that, but once we've had some time, we can't get it back. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my, my hairline is rapidly retreating. Um, I'm not, I can get hair plugs or something, but I can't get my youth back. Mm -hmm. um, and if people don't care about that kind of thing, maybe they're not as middle-aged as people. If people don't <laughs> care about that kind of thing, I, I don't understand what they're asking when they say, but why should we care? Mm -hmm. you know? I'm, I'm getting old and I'm never going to be young again and there's nothing I can do about it. Yeah, so uh, the, the issue about time really connects to us because we experience things in time. We are temporal yeah. beings as well. We have yes. hope for the future and regrets Nostalgia about... Nostalgia for the past. Yeah. Um, but it's not just that we experience time, but we can't you know, unless something's gone horribly wrong, we can't experience the world without experiencing it as a tiny one. <laughs> um, so it, there's a sort of inescapability to time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there are many theories of time in the philosophical literature. So you have here the A theory as opposed to the B theory. You also have the C theory, R theory, tens yeah. of the theories, and so on. So can you disentangle these things for us? I can certainly have a go. So I think we start off um, with a debate about change or about the moving now 
they might be two slightly different debates. They're often treated as the same debate. I'm going to, for simplicity, treat them as the same debate. So you need to think, as I said earlier, about whether now works in the same way as here or whether there's a difference. So A theories or tense theories or dynamic theories, these are more or less different terms for roughly the same debate, um, claim that there is some special changing nature to now, um, whereas all the other theories deny that pretty much. All the, all the non-dynamic theories, the, the static theories, the tense theories, the B or C or R theories, um, all deny that there's some special nature of change. So if you think that there's this special kind of change, change in what time it is, um, you then have a debate about the direction of time, whether there's a difference between the past and future. Is there an arrow of time? Um, so C theorists claim there is no arrow of time. Um, and the reason it seems like there's a difference between the past and future is actually there's uh, an entropic gradient that's given by the second law of thermodynamics. So physics creates this difference that makes it seem like a difference between past and future. But maybe this, this difference um, is local and perhaps contingent. It's not the difference in time, it's just a difference in, in entropy. So where the um, B theorist or the R theorist, or indeed the A theorist, think there's some kind of difference between earlier and later, um, the C theorist thinks that, that that's just entropy. So you've got this question about change, then this question about the arrow of time, and then thirdly, you finally get onto the temporal ontologies, the ones that start talking about existence. Um, so these are models of, of how we think about time in terms of what exists and, and changes potentially in what exists. So presentism claims that only the present exists or, or nothing that isn't present exists. Um, the grown block view um, claims that the past exists and the future doesn't. The moving spotlight claims that past, present, and future all exists, but there's a sort of changing now that moves along. Um, the shrinking tree um, is the view that not only do the past and the present exist, but all the future possibilities exist. So you've got this sort of branching structure where the branches drop off as they yeah. see to be possible. Um, and then eternalism um, is generally the view that past, present, and future all exist, but there's no distinctive now. They're all equally real um, and not distinguished in, in any ontological way. Um, so often these temporal ontologies presuppose some answers to the, the previous questions about whether there's an arrow of time or, or whether time passes. Um, so they tend to come sort of third in the, the order of operations, as it were. Okay, so I'll, I'm trying to make sense of the distinction here. So the A theories will be theories which are dynamic, they respect yeah. tensed uh, languages yeah. in a way. Then you have the B theories, which are static theories, they're tenseless theories. Then yeah. you have the C theories and the R theories as well. Then you have, yeah. th so those questions are about the nature of time, whether time has a direction, whether time flows, whether time is like. Yeah. Then you have the ontological theories or temporal ontologies. You have presentism yeah. and the growing block, which share the A theory commitment in a way. On most ways of understanding the A theory, yeah, they're, certainly they're both dynamic. Um, so what they disagree about is when I say things like Julius Caesar was assassinated, um, is that true because there's a bloke, Julius Caesar, and he was assassinated? Or is that true? Um, or is that not true? Or is that true because um, there used to be a bloke, but there isn't any longer? Um, and they, they put it in terms of existence. So, so a lot of this is a question of how you turn your dynamic theory into a sort of a, a, a rigorous and precise formal theory that has particular commitments. Um, the, the presentist is, is committed to certain, possibly the, exactly the same sentences being true as the growing block view, um, but disagrees on um, how they're made true. Okay, then you have the moving spotlight and iterated yeah. and the shrinking tree view, which has- Yeah, so Storrs McCall defended this in about 1994. So mm. this view um, is a bit like a moving spotlight, but thinks that there are multiple ways the future could go. Mm -hmm. And these 
these future possibilities cease to exist as they cease to be possible. Um, so um, it's, you can imagine a tree-like structure with the branches disappearing and the trunk being like the past. Okay, so, but that's a, still a dynamic view of time as well. Still a dynamic view, yeah. So of these theories here, the temporal ontologies here, which do you prefer? So I defend the growing block view. So I, I think that the past exists and the future doesn't. Oh, surely the past and the present exist for you. Well, it depends what you mean by the present. Um, so there's a <laughs> okay. sense in which I don't, I, I, I think there's no time like the present. So I don't think the present is like uh, a moment of time, which is neither, which is neither past nor, nor future. Mm -hmm. I think that events are present, this, this conversation is present because part of it exists, but it's still ongoing. Mm -hmm. So um, the reason I get to this view is essentially I've got two ontological statuses, exists and doesn't exist, and I've got three tenses. And there's a problem of how you get the three tenses into two ontological statuses. And so the best way of thinking about it, I found, is to think of the present in some sense as being um, partially existing, but having this potential for more to happen. Um, so in the bit of it that exists is just recent past. Um, there is no bit of it that doesn't exist because you can't have bits of things that don't exist. So it's the idea that there's stuff that's started to happen but is ongoing. Mm -hmm. that, that's roughly the idea with the present. Okay, uh, we'll get into your view some more later. But for now, yeah. let's, let's talk about some time puzzles. So the philosophical literature has interesting puzzles about time. Also, it does. So, yeah, let's start with. Uh, the problem of change. What is this problem all about? Um, so I've touched on it a little already. Um, it's a problem that really um, we get from a kind of 1920s University of Cambridge um, where they're trying to, to work out what it is for something to change. And they come up with this criterion, which is if you have a proposition that's true at one time and false at another, or two propositions which are exactly the same except one is about one time and one is about the other and one's true and one's false. You can do it either way, depending on what you think the propositions are. This idea that you have propositions where there's the only difference between them is the time, um, but there's a change in truth value. That gives you an account of change. It just gives you a really terrible account of change because it means that I can change you by moving my chair back. So now you are different with respect to your distance to me. Um, and so you, so you get what's called Cambridge change, which is just this very general account of change that doesn't pick out the kind of features of change we're interested in. And mere Cambridge change, which is those changes that aren't the changes we're interested in, but still satisfy this, this notion of Cambridge change. Um, so you had two sort of more specific views of change, um, one associated with Bertrand Russell, um, also known as at-at change, where change just is an analog of variation over space. So um, uh, it, things are one way at one time and another way at another time, hence at-at change. So it's just you describe things at different times if they're not the same at the at different times they've changed. Um, whereas the British idealist philosopher also at Cambridge, John McTaggart, Ellis McTaggart, yes, he genuinely has McTaggart twice in one name. Um, <laughs> McTaggart, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I think it was something that he had to change his surname to get a, a legacy or something, but he already had the middle name as a family. Oh, doesn't matter. So um, he's got this example of um, a poker in the sense of a, a bit of metal that virtually no one is familiar with anymore, but he used it to prod a fire. His thought is this bit of metal that's hot at one end and cold at another varies over its length. But that's different from it being hot on Monday and cold on Tuesday. That, that there's some disanalogy between varying over the length of the, the poker and 
changing between Monday and Tuesday. Um, and so there must be something about change over time that's different to change across space. Um, and whatever that change is, that's characteristic of the passage of time, the change between the poker on Monday and the poker on Tuesday. So it's probably bound up with how things persist. Do they persist simply by varying across their parts or do they persist by having properties and then having different properties? Um, so that's the kind of problem of change. Are we thinking about change in Russell's kind of at-at sense or, or change in the, the sense that McTaggart wants, which I've started um, to call McChange, um, just to <laughs> clarify it's change in McTaggart's sense. If you, if you do it properly, the T gets pronounced, okay. McChange. McChange, okay, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so speaking of McTaggart, he has this famous paradox. So what is yes. this paradox all about? So, so given McTaggart thinks that for time to pass, you need this sense of change, he then also thinks that time couldn't possibly pass because nothing could change in the relevant sense. So he's got this strong view of what change is uh, as a kind of positive thesis. Um, and then this negative thesis, nothing could change in that sort of way. I've, I've spent a lot of time wrestling with this argument. Um, and in the end, I agree with C.D. Broad, also a Cambridge philosopher, that it's a philosophical howler, that it's an absolutely terrible argument. Um, but I also know lots of people who I really respect and, and, and are very clever who think the argument really works and it's an excellent argument and, and indeed it's, it's the view that I'm entirely wrong about the nature of time. Mm -hmm. So it's a weird um, position, um, quite a common one for a philosopher, but a weird position to be utterly convinced this argument is terrible, but also to be aware that I've got really good evidence by very clever people who I respect that I must be wrong about how terrible it is. <laughs> so, um, so I've got a bit of a, an interesting relationship with this argument. The argument is essentially that you need change in an irreducible sense, um, but a, any attempts to describe time will require that you explain how this change works. And in order to explain how this change works, you've got to sort of have a description that, that doesn't change. Um, but then you've either lost how the change works or you've ascribed multiple incompatible properties to things. So you're saying, well, things were this way and now they're that way. But to say that they were this way is to say that there's a true description of the universe according to which those things are present and one according to which these things are present and they can't both be present. Um, and so there's some kind of contradiction. Um, my favorite paper. Uh, on this is by uh, David H. Sanford in the 60s, who basically argued that McTaggart's argument is like a reductio ad absurdum, where you've forgotten that you're allowed to assume the thing in the first place to generate the contradiction. So if you accept that there's this weird sort of change where you can't describe it once and for all because it keeps changing on you, there's no paradox. You've just accepted that there's this this irreducible change that has no spatial analog. Um, the problem comes with thinking that this, this MOOC change has to be reduced down to a, a, a theory where you describe it in a static way. Like your theory of the universe is going to have to change because the universe is changing. Um, if you accept that, there's no paradox, but lots of people think that that's uh, a terrible thing to accept or a, an incoherent thing to accept. Okay, so I'm, I'm trying to make sense of this. Yeah, what I learned, it's very difficult. Yeah, so what I learned about McTaggart's paradox is that the first premise will yeah. be every event uh, is past, present, future because it yeah. goes through the flow of time. Okay, so it was. Yeah, apart from the first event in the universe and the last event, all right. of them are going to be past, present, and future. Yeah. Okay, then the second premise will be no event will be past, present, future because you can't have incompatible temporal locations. Yeah. Okay. Things can't both be past and not be past. Like. So the, the conclusion will be well, it's, it's incoherent to have those two things in, in your yeah. metaphysics. So 
your solution is, or at least some people would say, well, we drop premise two or we drop premise one. We can't have both. Is that yeah, right? there's a kind of dilemma that you either think not everything is past, present, and future. If you go for that dilemma, um, you might be attracted to presentism, just the view that only the present exists. Mm -hmm. This isn't going to help you in the end. But <laughs> people, uh, right. people think that, that that in some way helps. Um, you can set the problem up again, just talking about things being present, um, but having incompatible things being present. So presentism is not going to help. But, but some people have argued that way. The other thing is to say, let's drop the requirement for change. If we just have um, changes being temporal variation, things don't have incompatible properties because they just are the way they are at each time. Um, so, so the very idea of having change over time being different to variation over space just leads to incoherence, so we should drop it. So that's the kind of dilemma that people who like McTaggart set up. Now let's go to another puzzle. So this one is a more, more recent Quote and unquote 60s puzzle by Sid Shoemaker. It's time without yeah. So how does it work? So it's it's kind of quite a, an odd argument. And it's important to remember what the argument is an argument for, because people often seem to forget this. Um, he's trying to show that it's possible that there could be a situation in which we can have evidence that time has passed with no change during it. So he's not actually arguing that there could be time without change. He's arguing that there could be circumstances under which we could have evidence that there could be time without change. So maybe there couldn't be time without change round here, but yeah. there are some situations in which we could have reason to believe that there was. Um, so he imagines the, the universe is divided exclusively and exhaustively into three regions. Um, so the entire universe is made up of three regions. And every now and again, we notice that the other regions kind of become in inaccessible for a, for a bit. And then, you know, about a year, just, just put a number on it, about a year, these regions become inaccessible. And then after a year, we notice that apparently nothing has happened since they were last accessible. Um, and they have different periods during which they have these freezes and these, these, these periods of inaccessibility. And the periods are related in such a way that we think, hey, if we also had freezes, which occasionally the other regions support um, report us doing, there'll be some point in time where we all have such a freeze at the same time, and we can make sense of, of the sort of regularity if say every 60 years each region freezes it would just it would mean that we could say that region a freezes every um three years region b freezes every four years and region c freezes every five years if once every 60 years they're all frozen at the same time just nice nice regular pattern that we would get so if we were in such a scenario we would have reason to believe that the entire universe freezes for about a year um, every 60 years. Now, the problems with this argument um, tend to come when we explain why the freezes stop. Because we could explain why region A stops freezing, because there could be some kind of causal trigger from one of the other reasons, regions, um, and, and so on for each individual reason. Re sorry, each individual region. Um, Coming up with a reason for the entire universe to, to unfreeze that doesn't involve some little tiny change happening of like a little countdown timer or something going right, well, it's it's now 10 months till we unfreeze and mm. don't don't cause the don't cause the unfreeze for another 10 months. You know, what mechanism is gonna cause this to stop? It, it looks like we'd have reason to think that there was some changing mechanism that was counting down to the unfreeze. So the argument maybe doesn't work in the end, but it is a really interesting way to get us to think about what kind of things would count as evidence for views that on the surface 
look like they're empirically equivalent, the views that look like there couldn't be any, any kind of physical um, difference between. I remember this one. So Aristotle once said that you can't have time without change. So I think this, the shoemaker argument tries to give an, well, some empirical, well, sorry, let's not have empirical, some epistemic reasons to think that, well, it's possible the time without change. But the counter argument is, well, there's still some change there if you think about how the unfreezing happens every year yeah. so often. Is and, that, I mean, we should always be a bit cautious attributing stuff to Aristotle. Um, <laughs> okay. so, so Aristotle said something like time is the number of change. Mm. So the word chronos in Greek is used to measure um, durations as opposed to the other word for time in Greek, kairos, which is used um, to think about opportunity. So, so when is the right moment for action? So mm -hmm. it may be that he was distinguishing between um, time as measured and time as um, moments for action. Um, it's, it's unclear whether he was thinking about kind of this metaphysical question at all. Okay. Um, but certainly we've attributed the view to him that there couldn't be time without change. Um, it's, I mean, I'm not, I'm not clear that he ever actually like thought about anything quite this abstract. Okay. Fair enough. I mean, I'm not an Aristotle scholar. I'm just <laughs> enough of a... Um, enough of a non-Aristotle scholar to know that every time I talk to Aristotle scholars about this stuff, they go, whoa, 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 whoa. Why, <laughs> why do you think Aristotle said that? Okay. So, so the, the, the kind of, the, the Aristotle that, that metaphysicians like to talk about thought that, but um, I, I encourage people to get into the Aristotle because there's a lot of interesting stuff there um, that, that makes you think. Okay, speaking of time with regard to action, so there's a, yeah. another sort of puzzle concerning time bias or temporally biased attitudes. One such um, time bias is feature bias, right? So how, yeah. how, how does it work, this, this puzzle? So Megan Sullivan has an absolutely fantastic, fairly recent book um, on, on time biases, which I, I recommend if you want to get into this. Um, so, so we seem to have a couple of biases. So um, one of them is the, a kind of near bias. So we tend to be more interested in, in recent things um, or things in the near future. And then there's a, a future bias where um, we'd rather have pain in the future. Sorry, we'd rather um, have pain in the past rather than the future. Yep. So if I wake up a, a bit sort of drugged up, and I'm not sure whether I've just had an operation and can't remember it, or I'm just about to have an operation um, and I've, I've got confused about this. And the operation, the, drug, the drugs I'm on only remove my memory, they don't remove the experience. So that if I've had the operation, it was horribly painful and I can't remember it. And if I'm about to have the operation, I'll experience everything, but then forget it afterwards. So in this situation, the thought is, and this argument's from Derek Parfit, the thought is that we'd rather have the, um, the operation over and done with. We'd rather, we'd rather have the pain in the past rather than the future. And so then if you get into decision theory, which I'm going to try and avoid doing today, but you get into decision theory and you're thinking, right, so I want to, to maximize expected utility. I want to have, um, utility is just your measure of what you think is good and, um, the expected bit is just how likely that you think it is. We want to have something that we think will give us most of the good stuff. If I think past pain is, is less bad than future pain or, or future goods are, are more good than past goods, someone could trick me into a situation where I keep having pain because I don't care about past pain. So as soon as the pain's passed, I'm prepared to trade off more past pain mm. by doing things that will um, will mean that I I keep you know I keep being in a situation where I make choices to trade off um, past pain against future pain. So more of my pain is in the past, um, and you can you can mess with the numbers so you get structures like this. 
And so these are pain pumps um, where, where you can just have a situation where you have way more pain in the end than you would have on some other situation. But at each moment you choose, you're maximizing expected utility because you've got this distinction between past pain and future pain. Um, and so that looks totally irrational in the long run. Mm -hmm. And so Sullivan and, and Green and Sullivan in, in other papers they've done argue that we shouldn't have any bias between past and future um, when it comes to these decision theoretic calculations. Because if we have bias, we end up in these irrational situations. Um, I think these arguments are really interesting, but I think a lot of the work is being done by being utilitarian about it, by thinking that there are you know, quantities of goods at certain times, and what we're doing when we act is just to try and work out where in time we want these quantities of good. Right. Um, I think we can make much more sense of how our different attitudes towards the past and future work if we don't think of it as just distributing quantities of goods, but think about um, the kind of relationships we have, for instance. So my relationship to my grandfather is very different to my relationship to my grandchildren. Why is this? Well, my grandfather's dead, but I remember happy childhood memories of, of being with him. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have any memories of my grandchildren because not only do I not have any grandchildren, I don't have any children. Like, <laughs> it's really unclear that I'm talking about anybody at all. Mm -hmm. um, Elizabeth Harmon has a really nice argument um, that, that captures this quite well, in which she considers a, a teenage mother who accepts that their life would have gone better in every way that matters if they hadn't had a, a child when they were 15. Mm. Nonetheless, they actually do have a child whom they love a lot and they wouldn't trade this actual child which they care for, for an alternative life in which they waited and had possibly a nicer child who was better brought up and happier and the whole family would have been wealthier. wealthier. But trading the actual child for a potential alternative seems kind of incompatible with how loving relationships are supposed to go. Mm -hmm. So there seems to be a difference between actual loving relationships and nearly potential relationships where we can't trade the actual for the potential. So I think the difference between the past and future here might be a difference between actual and potential, um, which trading potential past pain to potential future pain doesn't really capture. So, so I think if we're making sense of the difference between past and future when it comes to kind of affect to, to how we feel about it. Sullivan's going to be right that we shouldn't just trade off, um, shouldn't, shouldn't prefer in the abstract pains to be past rather than future. Mm. We should think about how our relationships to things we're, we're actually acquainted with, relationships of nostalgia, of hope, of, of love, um, of, of various things like that. Um, work in terms of the actual and the potential. But of course, perhaps you can do these things where, um, where I've got an actual child whose future I have great ambitions for <laughs> versus uh, a possible relative, but I don't know if I'm really related to them. And, you know, maybe I am related to, to James Keir Hardy. Maybe I'm not. We're not really sure because... <laughs> Um, a, a relative that lost contact with their family. And so, so maybe it's not going to be totally a past future distinction. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but it might be the stuff that's, that's creating the, the worry about our different relationships between past and future is to do with how, how relationships to actual and potential work rather than just where we want pains to be. No, I like that uh, understanding. So, on the one hand, this puzzle is generated, the bias is generated because of quantitative thinking about goods, pains, and yes. sufferings, and so on. Now, you're suggesting, or at least some people are suggesting, like, 
yeah, Preston Green and Sullivan are suggesting that perhaps you could have a qualitative view of what's going on there, qualitative relationships, um, not just assigning some value, but more of the qualitative, um, you know, how the quality of your relationship is with yeah. the thing that you're thinking about, be it in the past or the future, or be yeah. it actual or potential. Now, yeah. on to the last puzzle. So this one generated a lot of discussions in the 70s, but we have, I think most of us, even our general audience, would have an inkling of what this is. So these are the paradoxes of time travel. So what are yeah. these paradoxes? Okay, so in terms of time travel, um, a lot of the problems you kind of don't need much time travel for. Um, and, and when I say time travel, I'm, I'm going to assume we mean time travel to the past. Um, as Van Inwagen famously said, this chair is the limiting case of a time machine. If you sit in it for 70 years, you'd have traveled 70 years into the future. <laughs> so when we talk about time travel, like we're all, easiest thing in the world, we're all doing it. But, um, but there's a sense in which we like time travel to the past. This creates, it's a, a situation where things that are future in some sense are also past in some sense. So they might be in your personal future um, and also in your personal past. Um, and that creates some problems. But a lot of the problems might be problems that we would get anyway. So in English, when we say that something will happen, we usually rule out the possibility that something else could happen or we're just expressing an intention that we want something to happen, which isn't quite the same as predicting. But if we're predicting, saying, no, no, I predict this will happen. We're ruling out that something else might happen. Um, if we try and change something in the past, um, the fact that it's in the past might make us think, well, we know it will happen because it has happened. We can, we can go from the fact that something has happened to the fact that it will happen because the past and the future are just the same um, here. Nonetheless, it looks like we can do things in the future. Um, we can bring about things and we have lots of capacities to do things. So I have the capacity to press buttons. If if there's a situation in the past where my grandfather could be killed by my pressing a button and it and I'm in the past and I'm confronted with this button, it seems like I could just press the button. And that pressing that button would kill my grandfather. Um, but I know that my grandfather will not be killed because he was not killed because I'm here. Um, so, so there's a kind of trick here of how we make sense of on the one hand our having this apparent capacity to do a really straightforward thing and our knowledge that we don't do it. So one thought here which is a thought that kind of comes via Elizabeth Anscombe that we just can't intend things that we think are impossible because if we intend something we're we plan to do it and we can't plan to do things that we think are impossible. We can plan to do things that we don't know are impossible. We can't succeed, but we can certainly plan. Um, so if the future isn't really different to the past, if you've got a static view, an eternalist view on which past, future, past, present and future are all kind of on a par, there's no real difference between the difficulty of killing your grandfather and the difficulty of killing your grandchildren. I mean, you probably shouldn't do any of these things. <laughs> and there's a question about whether you do. Mm -hmm. um, but that question, whether you know it or not, is, is settled. So, so the question about what our capacities to do things are just comes apart from whether they happen. And so what you can do comes apart from what you will do. Um, Given how I think about the past, time travel to the past is ruled out already um, because 
I think the difference between the past and future is the future is potential and the past is actual and things can't be both potential and actual. Uh, well, if not in the same way, like things that are potential and actual are present according to me, but they can't, the same, the same bits can't be potential and actual. Like the start of this conversation is actual and the future is potential, but the future of this conversation can't both be actual and potential because that would be incoherent. So I've already ruled out the possibility of standing in front of a button that will kill my grandfather. Mm -hmm. um, so the paradox doesn't get going. But, um, but if you think, if you think you can travel to the past, that's a bit like thinking that the future is already there. And so whatever you say about the past, you also have to say about the future. So this isn't just interesting because, you know, we all like sci-fi stories. Yes. It's interesting because <laughs> if you don't think there's a difference between the past and future, you need to explain why these puzzles about affecting the past don't also affect the future. Yeah, okay, so let, let me try to get a handle yeah. on this. Yeah. So famously, there's the grandfather paradox, so you mentioned that. Yeah. So the question is, can you kill your grandfather in the past? So if you go back to the past, yeah. and suppose that he died, actually died in 2000, then you went back to 1950s and killed him. Can you kill him at that time? I think that's the point. Yeah. Then some philosophers would say you can't do that because that's changing facts in the past, but we can't change the, pa uh, the past. Some other philosophers would say, yes, you could change the past, but that's another way of, oh, that's another could or can. Your view so far, as I understand it, is that, well, you can change the past, but it's forever there. It's a potential, but it's not an actuality. Um, am I getting your view? Here? No, so I, I think that you can't change the past. Um, you can't change. If you were going to be, you know, <laughs> um, and, and, and indeed lots of people who think time travel is possible think that you can't change the past. They think that you have a loop where mm. you can't change the past, but you can't change the future either. I mean, I don't think you can change the future because I don't think there's a future there to change. Um, but I, um, so yeah, so there's a couple of distinctions that are useful. So one is whether you can change what happens at a certain time. Another is whether you can affect what happens at a certain time. So for me, if something has happened at a certain time, you can't change that. It's happened. It's actual. It can't go from being actual to not being actual. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why I don't think the future exists, because if it did exist, it would be actual and you wouldn't be able to change um, it. You, you wouldn't be able to change it if yeah. you'd be stuck with it. And we would just be kind of a node in this, this network of counterfactual dependence. We wouldn't actually be doing it. <laughs> People who think um, that the past and future both exist, they, they don't need to think that you can change them. Um, they just need to think that you can affect them. That is, that you can causally influence them. And the difference between them and me is I think that you need more than counterfactual dependence to causally influence something. You actually need to bring things about, bring them into existence. So I've just got this much richer notion of causation, and that's where the disagreement comes in. But sure, there's a sense in which there's nothing stopping you having a counterfactual dependence between you and your grandfather such that if you hadn't traveled back in time your grandfather wouldn't have died the problem is that you also counterfactually depend on your grandfather not dying right right <laughs> because he has to conceive your parent and your parent has to conceive you in order for you to show up um now you might think what about a case where it's just contradictory. In that case, it doesn't look like however you came into existence was caused by that thing that you affected, that there, as it were, branches, one of which you're on, 
and one of which your grandfather gets killed on. But the, the branch on which your grandfather get killed isn't your past, it's somebody else's past. Uh, or, or nobody's past or something, you know. Um, and so that's not really changing the past, that's just creating this extra branch, which doesn't <laughs> affect you, as it were. Um, do, you so, so, that, uh, do you consider that as time travel? No. Okay. No, no, that's dimensional travel or something. Yeah, that's good. So we're clear, that's not time travel here. That's not time travel. Yeah, so Back to the Future isn't a time travel film. <laughs> Unfortunately for you guys. Okay. And <laughs> I mean, whereas, um, I'm trying to think, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure is excellent. Like, seriously, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure is one of the best time travel movies ever. It's totally consistent. Yeah, I agree, um, I agree. <laughs> um, sometimes people stupidly think that 80s comedy films can't be philosophically deep, but they're wrong. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, so we've got this idea of can you affect the past? There seems to be no reason why you couldn't have the right kind of counterfactual dependence, apart from that you generate a loop, and that loop seems to be inconsistent. Um, but the mere fact that it would be inconsistent doesn't seem to affect anybody's sort of physical capacities. So you either have the, the kind of banana skin approach where there's nothing to stop, you know, you can have all the capacities, they will just fail for just various kind of coincidental non-causal reasons. You'll just slip on a banana skin just as you're about to press the button. And then, fail. but you've got the capacity right, right. to step on the button. And of course, capacities here aren't very modally rich. They're just descriptions of um, abilities. Thing of of yeah, descriptions of abilities mm. um, in terms of of compossibility of things that could could be possible with each other. Mm. Whereas when I talk about capacities, I'm thinking of things that can generate effects and bring effects into existence and so that rules out the very possibility of time travel so it's it's a difference between a, a kind of human approach to causation um where you just think um causes are are just kind of descriptions of non-accidental regularities of some kind or or counterfactual dependencies whereas i think that there's something kind of productive, or as they say in Australia, biffy. Mm. There's some, some biffiness, or um, where something makes the other thing happen. There's a, there's a connection, a modal connection between the two. Um, given how I think that works, you're not going to get time travel to the past going because you can't make sense of that kind of causal connection. Right. So there's another argument here that's interesting, the nowhere argument. Are you, so yeah. what is that argument all about? So it's another time travel. Uh, it's against time travel, right? So I'm not, sure, I'm not sure I know this argument under that description. So the nowhere argument. So how can you travel to somewhere or somewhere that does not exist? So if you are... Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I, yeah, I'm familiar with you. Yep. I mean, of course, it always exists when you get there. Um, <laughs> right. Um, yeah, so, so I, um, I did a nice talk on this in Birmingham a few years ago, actually. Um, so it depends, I mean, again, this looks like it creates a problem just for normal views of time, right? So on my, on my growing block view, um, I think the present is being created as you go, you know, like it's um, it's always present when you get there, but it wasn't present. I mean, it didn't exist until you got there and it's um, it's you're being created as much as it's being created um, and so on. So you have to have some story about how that works. In my case, it's a kind of causal story, mm. but um, it's not just that when I'm playing pool and I have one billiard ball bashing into another billiard ball, that the causal impulse goes from one to the other, but that the pool table that gets brought into existence 
and you is each moment by causation as well. That there's this sort of causal fizz um, of, of creating the next space-time atoms and, and whatever properties they have. So in the case of time travel, you've kind of got a problem of how there can be action at a distance. So how something over here can cause something to come into existence over there. Even if you're going into the past, you can think of it like um, an old kind of VCR where you're recording over the VCR. Like, how can you, how can you have the equivalent of the, the erase head and then the, the right head kind of sweeping through the past? You've got to have some kind of mechanism for doing that. If it's causation, how can causation happen across this dis distance if it's something else? How can that work um, in this way? How does it know when to go? Could you have like a horrible problem where you travel to one time, but the rewriting happens at a different time? So you, you just get stuck in this, this moment, and then there's all this change happening in what previously was past, but going forward. So, so this kind of challenges you to have some account of what's happening when time passes normally and to work out how that account can account to travel to somewhere else. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm very skeptical that whatever good account you have of what, what it is for time to pass normally, what it is for, the, for one present to become another present, that that's going to make sense if you try and do it for like a distant time. Hmm. Okay, so we've been talking about your view, but let, let's try to uh, make it more explicit. So you and your yeah. co-author, Ray Briggs, defended a version of the growing block or growing universe view. So yeah. first, let's first distinguish that from C.D. Broad's growing block view. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, so C.D. Broad, um, for one thing, didn't think that there were any truths about the future. Mm -hmm. So certainly with my work with Ray, we were interested in, in understanding how there can be truths about the future. So the general idea for the growing block view is that the, the past exists and the future doesn't. Um, and the passage of time is stuff coming into existence, or as C.D. Broad would put it, becoming. So, mm. so far, we agree with, with C.D. Broad. We've got past exists, future doesn't, and there's becoming absolute becoming so it's not merely becoming from my perspective it's it's becoming without further qualification um, and as i've kind of gestured to earlier the reason we care about existence is that stuff that exists is in a position to make sentences true mm. so we've got sentences about julius caesar julius caesar was assassinated i think that's true and i think it's true because of something involving julius caesar um, and some knives and Brutus and, and <laughs> okay. so the point is I seem to be talking about someone and saying of him that he was assassinated. If I compare him to a fictional character like Coriolanus Snow from the Hunger Games, doesn't really seem in the same way that I'm talking about anybody. I might pretend I'm talking about somebody, but it's not like I can point at the person and go, you know, I'm talking about that guy. I can point at the actor, but that's not quite enough. Um, so, so that's the reason for thinking the past exists. Um, Broad has a fantastic explanation of why we can't talk um, about the future. Um, it's not really an argument, it's just a, a kind of ni nice analogy. Um, you can't talk about the future for the same reason that prevents you from robbing a Highlander of his breeks. <laughs> so for, for those of you um, not familiar with Scottish culture, um, those from the Highlands are famous for not wearing trousers or breeks, mm -hmm. but for wearing kilts. So you can't take the, the bricks off a Highland man um, because he's not wearing any. Uh, so okay. you can't talk about the future for the same reason that stops you wear, um, from stealing the trousers off someone wearing a kilt. There just aren't any trousers to steal. Mm. So that idea that our ability to talk about my grandchildren or fictional characters 
isn't the same as my ability to talk about historical characters, even though in the case of Caesar, he's also a fictional character mm -hmm. in Julius, you know, Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. But we can go look, Shakespeare, you've got Caesar wrong. That's, that's made up. That didn't happen. You know, the, the events of your play are massively compressed to compared to what happened. You can have a little entry on Wikipedia that says, historical accuracy, this is inaccurate in the following, you know. Um, <laughs> Okay. So, so we've got that thought, right. So given we've got that thought, Ray and I were really concerned to work out how we can make sense of all the truths it looks like we know about the future. It looks like we know that coronavirus isn't going to be finished next week. Okay. Like it looks, mm. like I'm, <laughs> I'm really going to plan my life around that. Mm -hmm. Like it's not, it's not just like, well, you know, I've kind of got this feeling like, I think I've got really good evidence, as much as I've got evidence for stuff I know about the past, you know. Um, so we need some account of future truth. But our idea is we should be able to generate this, this account of future truth in terms of what's already happened and whatever it is that constrains how the future goes, so the laws of nature or, or whatever. Um, whereas Broad just says that there aren't any truths about the future. And that's kind of odd because, as we've just said, it really looks like there are lots. Mm -hmm. Now, going back to the, the issue about the past. So when we talk about yeah. the past, is there something concrete, at least a historical past? So we can talk. Um, there are truths about the past, okay? Yeah. You, you might have evidence about it. But if you are going for the growing block view, isn't that inconsistent? Because from the point of view of past people, the historical yeah. Judas Caesar, we are in his future. So for him, we should not exist or we don't exist. How, how do you handle that? Okay, so there's no internal incoherence here. Okay. unless we accept McTaggart's argument. Mm -hmm. I mean, so basically that this objection is, um, and, and Craig, Craig Bourne actually explicitly said this, this is a version of McTaggart's argument. Um, so, so that's the first thing, but that's, that's, not, that's not an argument yet. That's just me denying that there's an incoherence. Like, right, right. <laughs> I refute you thus. Uh, no. um, so the second thing to note is that Caesar doesn't have a point of view. Like one of the most famous things about Caesar is that he's dead. Okay. <laughs> right. That's so, a fact. So dead, yeah, dead people don't have points of view. I'm mm. kind of assuming here. Um, so, so I think the mistake here comes, and it's a natural mistake for lots of people to make. Um, it comes from thinking of the growing block as being like a static block, but with the end missing. So you've got all these people who are present at each time that they they exist. And then there's this other moment, which in some other sense is present and there's some sort of causally stuff going on here. And then there's a gap. Mm -hmm. um, that's not how you should think about the growing block view, that it's not, they, they really disagree with the static views about what presentness is. So look, I think that Caesar exists because I think there are all these truths about Caesar but I don't think he's kind of wandering around. I don't think he's doing anything kind of present continuous, apart from maybe decaying, but, <laughs> but that's as it were, Caesar's, Caesar's corpse or something. It's not Caesar anymore. Uh -huh. um, okay, so um, the past in some sense is like the present in that they both exist, mm -hmm. modulo the stuff I said about the, existence of the present being slightly tricky. Um, but stuff like living seems to require not merely having some, some matter, but the matter being engaged in various processes. So respiration, metabolism, digestion. Um, having a point of view seems to require processes too. For example, living, but you know, perceiving, thinking, lots of things ending in ing. So the thought is, stuff that's past that isn't ongoing, um, like this conversation is ongoing, like stuff that's past 
isn't engaging in any of these processes. It's, it's, it's spent its, its causal fizz. It's now just a series of states at times. But of course, these states are times that are such that if they were present, we know what kind of processes they would be involved with, because we know um, we know about the change from potential to actual that you get when these kind of states and the laws of nature meet the potential of the future. But they've kind of they've not got any potential anymore. They've used it all for good or ill, and it, and they're just kind of statically there now in a much more you know in the static sense which i think all static views are committed to but the static defenders of static views deny but there's nothing happening there's no kind of creation of effects mm -hmm. there's no one going there's just a pattern of states spread across time we can use this pattern of states to to get truths about what did happen but it's not happening anymore and so Caesar has no point of view, he's not living, he's not in a position to criticize us. Of course, back when he was present, he was um, succeeded by no times, just by potential, and had all this potential, and was turning potential and um, potentiality into actuality. He wasn't in a position to think, hey, you guys are the future, because he had no idea who we were, but he was in a position to think, hey, you know, there's a load of future there <laughs> that hmm. that'll probably be different from this, and and probably you know maybe will read plays about me after I'm gone, and maybe horribly mischaracterize me. He was in a position to think that, but that was ages ago, right? Hmm. That's that's not happening anymore. That's the past. No, I, I, so I, there's I, always I, kind of two senses of past here: the past as the once present, mm -hmm. and the past as no longer you know of, of what was no you made the distinction i think that's important here so you're talking about the past uh, states so you have past yeah. states, but that they're not events they're not happening now i mean they're events in the sense that events are just there filled regions of space time so like quine talks about events in that way so i tend to distinguish between processes and events okay. and there are no processes but the literature is really confusing and events means all sorts of different things in different places. So the way I'm using it, if we use events as Quine did for filled regions of space time, loads of them, um, mm. but no processes, no, no cha you know, changing, unfolding mm -hmm. activities. Okay. So the past has those events or states, yeah. they're not moving, they're not processing, yeah. they're processed in the past yes exactly they're processed okay. but not processing <laughs> yeah so we are processing right now and the future yeah. for you is what What's potential it? potential so we are in the process of coming up with the future or making yeah actualizing right? the potential yeah yeah so but you're saying that there are future truths there are truths about the future so uh, sure. what, what's your story about the future contingent so um, so to the extent that there are any truths about the future they are constrained by some what ray and i call um some element of the nomological package so there's some some um some kind of causal or modal thing um could be the laws of nature could be dispositions or powers we're not really too bothered which you pick plug in your pet one but it's going to be realist it's going to be constraining in a way that a human picture where it's just a mosaic of different things at different times isn't going to be. we've got this um this constraining modal thing i'm just going to use laws because it's a nice short word um there are these laws and then there are these states in the past and present that create the kind of initial conditions for the laws. Um, the laws might be chancy, that's fine, but um, whatever truths there are about the future are just the truths that are generated by the combination of the laws of nature and the states that there already are. Um, 
Yeah. So, and, and if there are multiple opportunity, you know, multiple different possibilities, um, we provide three different semantics for dealing with those. But the supervaluationist one is kind of the most straightforward. Um, if every way the future can go, there will be a sea battle tomorrow. Then it's true that there will be a sea battle tomorrow. If on none of the ways the future can go, there will be a sea battle tomorrow. Then it's false that there will be a sea battle tomorrow. And if on some of it, some of the ways the future can go, there will be. And on some of the ways the future will go, there won't be. Then it's neither true nor false that there will be a sea battle tomorrow. And in fact, in our more recent paper, you can potentially put like a number on this and say it's it's point eight true that there will be a a sea battle tomorrow. I'm I'm not so committed to the the degrees of truth thing. Um, I'm happy to call it like it's point eight likely. It's it's more likely than not that there will be a sea battle tomorrow. But it's not true that there will, and it's not true that there won't be. Okay, so let let me figure out the semantics here. So there's a yeah. super valuationist semantics on the one hand. Yeah where some truths will be super true, some future truths will be super true or super false, yeah. and some others will be true or false. Some others yeah. will be neither true nor false. And, but you're not going for the fuzziness, the, the degrees of truth. Why is that? Because I reckon that... Um, I, I mean, so officially, Ray and I do go for the, the degrees of truth. I'm, I'm happy to talk to that, you know, talk in that way uh -huh. for the purposes of a paper. <laughs> I'm not sure I know what a degree of truth is unless it turns out to be something like a likelihood. Yeah, you know? a probability, right. Probably. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but officially that's how we talk. Um, so um, so <laughs> mainly I don't want people to get put off by this degrees of truth thing. Oh, that's really weird and mm -hmm. I mean, it's essentially just committing to there being a, a way of having some gradation between the thing that's definitely going to happen the thing that's definitely not going to happen like we can we can say how likely something is mm -hmm. and it's kind of quite straightforward theoretically to have a truth value of one a truth value of zero and then truth values in between right but if you don't like if you're put off by that just don't talk like that <laughs> i think ray is thinking about uh, decision theoretic language as well because you could plug in your decision matrix and so on yeah, yeah. using this language okay so finally now both so of I just us saw we had a question come up on what it would mean for the future to be probabilistic so mm -hmm. I, maybe yeah. i can clarify that so literally the, for the future to be probabilistic is just for the laws not to determine exactly what happens um but perhaps to make and so it could be that there's like a 50 50 chance and it could be that the laws um, actually give you particular probabil probabilities. I mean, it could be that there are situations where we can't put numbers on it and there's no, you know, there's no way of, of assigning probabilities. But it could be that something is genuinely random. Um, I've got this, you know, atomic, you know, particle with a half life. There's a 50 50 chance um, that it's going to decay in a certain time period. Half the possible futures that we're, we're kind of imagining in our model are going to be ones in which it decays, mm. half of them aren't. And so that's how we get the 50 50 probability. But it's going to be whatever in the laws of nature makes it the case that this atomic particle has a half life that, that's doing the work here. Okay, so before we entertain the questions from the audience, yeah. uh, last, so both of us are part of the new generation of academic philosophers. So what's your advice for people who may want to get into a career in academic philosophy? Okay, so I've been thinking about this a bit. Um, academic careers are quite tricky to get into. Like, one of the rudest things my sister has ever said to me was that once she takes early retirement from her career in business, she might become an academic. It's not a hobby, you know, like, like it's actually is a really difficult career to get into. <laughs> right. And takes a lot of work and involves a lot of career uncertainty. Um, so for myself, um, I was, it was about seven and a half years from finishing my PhD before getting any job security, you know, before having like a permanent job. That's kind of not 
not unusual. Some people are a bit quicker, some people take a bit longer, some people never get careers at all. Um, that's, that's something that you need to go in with your eyes open about. We would be misleading you if you, we didn't warn you of that. Nonetheless, you know, if an idiot like me can, can make it, there's, there's going to be some hope for you guys. Um, I think, so my tips are, it's much more of a team game than it often appears. So a big mistake I made when I first finished my PhD is, well, my supervisors aren't getting paid to supervise me anymore, so I mustn't bother them. And I mustn't, you know, I just have to sit in a, in a room by myself and tap away at my computer and produce excellent philosophy. That's not a good recipe for producing philosophy. I mean, Descartes medica um, meditated in this, you know, pot-bellied stove and produce the meditations, and they're terrible. Um, he's totally wrong, you know, you end up <laughs> worrying about demons that might be deceiving you and stuff. No, um, actually having a network of people that you talk to, attending events like this, you know, bouncing ideas off people, that's really important. Um, it's also important to have a life outside of philosophy. So if you get a rejection, which um, all of us often do, um, very frustratingly a lot um not your entire you know self-esteem is hanging on that you've got you've got something we go no well, i've got a nice life um i'm going to go for a walk with my friends and we're going to complain about politics for a bit and then come back and have another shot at it um one of the other final tips that i want to give is like any loving relationship the love of wisdom can require work from time to time to rediscover what it is you love about it mm -hmm. um and like any loving relationship sometimes love isn't enough um you need to put the work in you need to you need to rediscover what what makes you love what you do but you also need to be lucky and and you need to have the right kind of situation um some jobs aren't worth having um have you know own the decisions you make like either love the job you're in or look for another one and um, mm. lots of people it turns into a competition where i just have to get an academic job so i've i've won and they end up accepting a job in a really toxic place that they hate and are just miserable but they won and <laughs> um, i i myself you know turned down the opportunity of a permanent job because I couldn't see myself being in that institution for for a long period of time and then was very lucky to land the, the job that I got now um, so um, yeah take take ownership of it love what you do but you're not alone and try and try and look after each other and support each other okay so thanks again Graham for sharing your time with us <laughs> thanks for having me yeah, join me again for another episode of Philosophy and What Matters, where we talk about things that matter from a philosophical point of view. Thanks. <laughs>